Next, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our panelist, Jacqueline Chan, with the Public Health, and her topic is Youth, Health, and Beyond. In 2007, I was researching drinking water quality in rural villages of Ecuador. And in every single community that we visited, the water was very contaminated. And what was worse was that we saw remnants of abandoned concrete structures from where aid organizations had previously tried and failed to provide water and sanitation. I'm sure those, those of us who had traveled around also saw this and maybe asked the same question too. Why is this happening? Why are we seeing uh, development projects that are initiated and then failed within a couple years and soon after the organization leaves? So this question sparked my mission to understand why these projects are failing and what can help them succeed? I joined multiple organizations locally and globally to work alongside communities that I wanted to help, including the homeless, juvenile kids, and rural Excuse villages. Me, can we ask the speakers to stand? Oh. Just watching me and other people doing this trying to Sure. Are you, do, would you like a clipboard? What? Yeah, my voice is pretty small. You can borrow my clipboard. Does that help? I know, I usually have a podium okay. too. Is this, you're going to be great. Can you hear me? All right, so I joined multiple organizations um, to work side by side alongside the communities I wanted to help. That included the homeless population, juvenile kids, and villagers out in international uh, communities of Ecuador, Thailand, Haiti, and Ethiopia. I wanted to understand how to uplift communities out of poverty and towards their own health and self-sufficiency. and then. The crucial elements that I learned about was how community mobilization and youth involvement were critical components of sustaining health and development initiatives. One experience I'd like to share with you has and continues to uh, teach me so many things about development and continues to inspire me in my work. And it's a project in rural Haiti in the community of Bayonne Valley. Uh, um, we're, we're working alongside the community to establish a medical clinic. Uh, there's about a population of uh, 80,000 people in the valley. It's a remote area, about a six-hour drive northeast of Port-au-Prince. They have little to no infrastructure and limited access to services. To give you an idea, it took about one or two hours to walk to the nearest clinic, and it was a three-hour drive to get to the nearest hospital. So you can imagine how this can be a barrier in people who desperately need uh, preventative health services. So the project was actually started out in 1999 by a nonprofit led by a local leader. And um, over time, they realized they lacked the technical expertise and resources to make this vision a reality. So in 2004, they reached out to Engineers Without Borders for technical support and training. After suffici sufficient fundraising and uh, designing a hurricane-proof and sustainable clinic design, I traveled to Haiti to provide monitoring evaluation support of the, for the project to measure health impact. On the first day that I got there, the local leader, Amilor, walked with me along the main dirt road leading to the uh, clinic site. He described to me his vision for the local community and painted a picture of what the community could someday be, including the expansion of the medical clinic into a fully functioning hospital, more involvement of local students from the local schools, um, more business generated for the local markets, improved roads, infrastructure, and unifying the local people for future development. He pointed to the clinic site and said, this is the first step. I'd been so focused on evaluating the impact of um, and access for health and water that I was slow in recognizing that com the community was a complex and interconnected ecosystem. In this context of complexity, it would be difficult to accurately anticipate the effects of this intervention. So I shifted my focus. And I began, instead of asking, how can we get the outcome we want for this community, I, I asked, how can we help this community get what they want? We focused on providing technologies based on their needs, their values, and their capacity. So we trained en engineers and provided support to rebuild a bridge, make hurricane-proof buildings, and install the solar-powered electrical system. 
to support the clinic. In the following years, the community members independently constructed other hurricane-proof structures and extended the electrical system for their own needs. By including their desires and values as the centerpiece for development, the local leaders were able to mobilize themselves and set a foundation for other development projects to meet their, their needs. So on the last day of the clinic construction, the local community members from different ethnic groups had volunteered their time and took turns providing the manual labor needed to finish the project. It was a festive event because everybody was celebrating that they had finally, finally obtained this vision. Another thing that astounded me was that the local leaders had selected promising high school students to conduct household surveys to understand local health care access. As I trained and worked alongside them, the students told me about their aspirations to become teachers, lawyers, and journalists so that they can improve the lives of other people. They knew with fierce certainty that there must be change for improvement and that things will change for the better. By including the youth in development projects, the local community was providing them with the tools and the confidence to create their own vision of the future. And they were really preparing them to take on the role of future leaders in their community. So the clinic is now managed by the local community and now operating and providing basic health services for the people of Bayane, thanks to the dedication and vision of local leaders and effective community mobilization. In the future, we're counting on the next generation of leaders to adapt to any unanticipated effects of our current actions. And we have to prepare them for that. If we consider our global community as an interconnected, complex ecosystem, we must mobilize ourselves collectively around shared values and shared visions for a more sustainable and humane future. And that mobilization must involve the youth in the early phases of design, planning, and brainstorming. I hope we can build upon our collective intelligence to effectively tackle humanity's most pressing issues by learning from each other across sectors, across international boundaries, and across generations, so that we can say this is organized compassion at its best. I love her closing words, organized compassion. That's so beautiful. That's, of course, moving right on. John Madison, you've got 10 minutes to bring us home before our break. Thank you so much. And thanks to Roberta for my great back massage. I am really ready for this talk now. So I was tempted to completely start from scratch after our first three speakers uh, set the table so well. So I just want to make a couple of comments tying together those initial three talks. Um, I've got a lavalier. Is it working? Oh, sorry. Is this working? Are we hearing? Okay. okay, we're good. Um, so, how many of you have seen the TED Talk, The Golden Circle? Okay. Just, it's a, what, where why is the most important question we ask. Not how, not what, but why. So the sustainability um, of all of the compassionate action that we're all talking about really has to be focused on why. And so, Maylin start off with talking about joy. Uh, Kimberly talked about gratitude. Um, my wife has taught me to, that we need to learn more from our children. We have this up, upside down notion of we need to teach our children, we need to learn more from our children. And one of the things that I think we need to learn the most is uh, how to actively cultivate and express empathy. And so if there's a single why for me which underpins what we're all trying to achieve, it is empathy and an understanding for the situation that others live in. Um, I've, I've, I uh, was blessed with three children and taught every one of them from a very young age that happiness is a choice. Um, Bhutan has uh, created a uh, substitute for the gross national product called gross national happiness. And they actually focus uh, policy and initiatives around happiness. And I'd like to say that while I'm, I've dedicated most of my career to health care, um, health care is not at the top of the pyramid. There's much more about community health and resilience that we need to address. Um, so, uh, the, a comment was made earlier about a systematic process underpinned by systematic values. So it's the values that we choose to uh, promulgate. And I'm, I'm working with a group of folks uh, very similar to what Sandy was talking about earlier um, to curate the notion of how we connect the why with the what and the how um, of these global changes. And one of the things that I'm most fascinated by is I've spent a lot of my career working in evidence-based medicine. How do we create an evidence basis for which foundations, which philanthropies, which NGOs 
create the best value at the lowest cost for a particular cause? How do we have effective tools for assessing individual communities? This gets back to John's question about how do we scale all of this? And I think one of the key questions is, um, how do we do a, an effective assessment of what the needs of a community is? And every community is different. Their needs are different. How do we validate those needs? How do we understand the capacity and the appetite of that community for change? And then how do we use an evidence-based approach to what are the things that could actually address the issues that are relevant to that community and coordinate uh, a symphony of all these NGOs and, and uh, philanthropies and foundations and governmental institutions that fit both the gap that's known for that community, the tools that are available to address those gaps, um, and the appetite and the capacity for that community to implement change. So there's a group of us that are sort of curating this, but really trying to drive it down to why. So how do we underpin it? We're, we're coming to believe that this is a two to three generational uh, initiative because we really need to focus on the children and we really need to find systematic ways of instilling compassion and caring. And I'm going to talk a little bit in the context of children and health care. So um, the key drivers of health care, there, there are really five of them. The, the pervasive influence of pharmaceuticals, failure to implement evidence-based preventive care, uh, fee-for-service, fee-for-volume, payment incentives, end-of-life care, and then disorders of lifestyle. I'm going to speak more to the disorders of lifestyle. Um, which are leading to our epidemics of obesity and diabetes. But make no mistake, there is solid uh, scientific evidence linking obesity and diabetes to dementia, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and a wide array um, of other problems. So this really is an epidemic of lifestyle. So personalized medicine has been advocated, uh, and this Personalized Medicine World Conference held here at Stanford every year, um, as being a, a key to the solution. And so how do we address lifestyle decisions? We don't do that in the clinic and the hospital. Uh, our decisions that affect our health are made where we live, work, play, learn, and worship. And we really need to have uh, tools that help us wherever we are. So mobile apps will play a role. They're not the only thing, but they will, they will absolutely play a role to help us be true to our values and our objectives uh, wherever we live. So I like to think of mobile as being an upside down construct. It's really stationary. Our phone goes wherever we are. It's attached to us. So we can implement uh, those uh, levers and tools uh, to help ourselves. Um, there's a whole literature on behavioral economics and motivational science um, that we're bringing to bear in these mobile applications. Uh, but it's, it's also very clear, coming back to children, that our adverse lifestyle habits are largely shaped, shaped in childhood. And hence, early intervention in childhood really becomes critical for the health of the community and the health of generations. So there was a study done with 17,000 participants by the Centers for Disease Control and uh, Kaiser Permanente in San Diego looking at adverse childhood experiences, what the long-term impact was. Uh, detailed uh, evaluation of children who are suffering from abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. So what they found is very clear. Their persistent, adverse uh, disruption of brain architecture, increased cognitive impairment, developmental delays, and increased risk of stress-related disease and health problems. If we don't take this, uh, these problems on early in development, if we don't support the moms who are raising these children, if we do not support the children in avoiding these stressful experiences, we're ignoring one of the fundamental challenges that we face uh, as a civilization. So the quantified self-movement is something uh, that has been uh, very much avant-garde because we have all the technology now to do sensing of everything. We, we breathe, our heart rates, where we go, our exposure in the environment. And uh, one of the things that I am really focused on is bringing together all of these different tools in a big data analytics world to work at, look at what really matters. Um, and we have quite an opportunity to learn from putting data sets together across multiple disparate data types and figuring out what is associated with what, what causes what, and being able to address that. A couple of mantras to thrive by. The uh, secret to patient care is caring for the patient. The secret to health is caring for the person. That's the whole person, not the patient that shows up in the clinic. The secret to wellness is caring for the family and the social network. And the secret to resilience, uh, which is what Kimberly and others spoke to, is uh, caring for the community. So I'm working with the Public Health Informatics Institute, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Institute for Alternative Futures, uh, to really bring about a new consciousness about how we create resilience for a community. So the Behavioral Symphony for Wellness is a, is a term that I coined to address the fact that mobile apps have been the be-all, cure-all sort of buzzword, if you will, 
and they're, they're insufficient by themselves. We need to use them as adjuncts for shifting behavior, but they're in the context of the community and the social determinants of health. So the social determinants of health um, have a profound influence. Um, and again, the, the Bhutan Gross National Happiness reflects a whole different way of looking at it. So this new ecosystem that I'm interested in and Sandy spoke to so eloquently earlier is an evidence-based coordinated compassion and action that addresses the community, the, the specific community, and to John's point about scaling, the unique aspects of different communities. So the healthcare ecosystem is what I refer to as a multi-platform ecosystem that's emerging in this world of technological exponentiality. We have exponentiality with the internet and the cloud, the smartphone, and, and now video dial tone, which we uh, are, are, are diffusing throughout our system to have uh, the capability of video consultation uh, on the moment, anywhere. Uh, the social ohm is all the digital data, the quantified self. I'm one of the subjects in a study here at Stanford where every three months I come and I have 6,000 blood tests, my, my complete genome done, and three, uh, four microbiomes, the bacteria that inhabit our gut. There's 10 times as many bacteria cells in our body, 100 times as many genes in that ecosystem there are in our body. So I have four microbiomes and 6,000 blood tests done every three months and whenever I get sick or stressed. And that is being put into a massive database for analytics of looking at some of the, the, the relationship between lifestyle and health. Um, the exposome I've talked about um, in, in terms of having multiple sensors. Um, $1,000 genome was just announced a month ago. Uh, electronic health record data is what I did with implementing health records. Predictive analytics with machine learning, AI, and visualization. Um, uh, my prediction is we'll have 10 times more knowledge generated in silico from research, not from actual physical studies or prospective randomized trials by the year 2020 as we do from conventional studies. Persuasive technologies, BJ Fogg here at Stanford is a big uh, pioneer in this space. And then finally, avatars, robotics, heads up displays, 3D printing, all are increasingly brokering our digital relationship between us as a person and the universe. So what does this all mean when we have all this stuff coming together? Uh, one of the first consequences <coughs> is what I call transparency in the black box. The whole post-Snowden era and the NSA and privacy and so forth, how are we gonna resolve that? Um, there's a lot of uh, different ways of thinking about it, but one of the ways that I think about looking at it is we need to have much more reciprocal transparency. So what's known about us, we have the right to have reciprocity in who's watching us. And that's a lot of what Snowden said, is we need to have oversight of the oversight of um, who's watching. And so if you look at the various um, uh, sort of examples of lack of reciprocal transparency, the credit default swaps causing the economic meltdown, the hanging chads in the uh, Al Gore uh, presidential election, um, and other forms, it's a lack of reciprocal transparency which is a fundamental problem um, in being able to deal with these large data sets. So who has our data and what are they doing with it? Uh, both the Pew uh, Research Fund and the Institute of Medicine have published papers recently about how patient, people are less concerned about who has their data than what they're doing with it. If they trust the people to, for what they're using the data for, it's, it's a very different question. So I'm looking at supporting three different conversations in healthcare using visualization tools and big data in my last minute. Um, so first is a conversation between the patient and their professional care team. The second is between the patient and their personal care team, which is increasingly important in the world of the person-centric care and the personal health record and the quantified self. And the third conversation is between that patient and the person that houses them in the form of person centricity. So the primary sort is going to be value based. So um, it, how much are you willing to commit to your health? How much risk are you willing to take for how much benefit? And to array options in those kinds of value sets and then the role of the physician becomes much more as a guide or interpreter to how do we match options with your value set. So the role of pervasive sensing, three types, uh, the athlete warrior for real-time tuning, the cr chronic illness post-discharge in the hospital for er event detection and intervention. The rest of it should be for mindfulness. So if you've ever worn a pedometer, most people fatigue on a digital nanny, okay? It's just this constant sort of nagging reminder. What we really need to do is instead of saying how many steps did I take today, when we see the elevator, we should ask ourselves, where's the stairway? And we should take the path of most resistance. We should really be mindful, and we've had several mindful exercises today already. Thank you so much. Um, and it is about mindfulness that is going to be creating more of our health. The blue zones have been studied uh, for decades around the world, communities where long life and health have occurred. And it's mostly about living simply, regular exercise, having healthy social relationships, good regular sleep, uh, healthy fresh food, local food. It's not that difficult. So we need to get to a state of mindfulness. 
So where's the evolution of man going? So this is, this is what I call homo metricus with the athlete warrior. And at Computer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this year, there were hundreds of wearable sensors for athletes and others. Um, another alternative is Homo geekus, and many of us may resemble this uh, particular evolutionary pathway. And then thanks to McDonald's, we have Homo fasciterus. <laughs> but I don't think that's where we want to go. So where I think we want to go is to uh, be what I describe as mindful man, where we really do focus internally. We really do focus on those values that uh, that we appreciate the most and that connect us to our social systems in the universe. And then finally, I'm going to end on a quote that's hanging in the Health and Human Services um, at, uh, in Washington, D.C. by H Hubert Humphrey. He says, it's been said the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in, dawn, in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. And I think that that it has been a traditional mantra to really focus why we do what we do in healthcare. But there's a new problem emerging, and I just want to throw it out as a question. If you haven't read the book, The Second Machine Age, it was just published last week. I highly recommend it. It's two uh, MIT professors, and they've asked the question, observing that robotics and AI are displacing jobs massively. China has a net loss of 50 million jobs in the past couple of years. Uh, Google just announced the robotics are going to be deployed at Foxconn, which makes all of our smartphones and smart pads. They are unemploying the low-level employment that we've offshored is happening across the world. So how do we transform into a culture of empathy um, where we value new forms of work uh, based on empathy, compassion, and community? And I think we can find that path. I encourage you to read that book. There is a a prescription for how we might approach that, and I think it's something worth paying attention to. Thank you very much. <laughs>